Coming up on today's Airborne. A new bill would cut regulations for general aviation. There's a new course for the 2013 Air Venture Cup race. And the X-47B makes its first carrier trap on land. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. In a move that would cut regulations on the general aviation industry and thereby improve safety, decrease costs, and free private sector innovation, Congressman Mike Pompeo has introduced the Small Aircraft Revitalization Act. The bill addresses a number of challenges facing the general aviation industry caused by outdated regulation, including the steady decline in new pilots, flight activities, and the sales of new small general aviation airplanes. For example, the average general aviation airplane is 40 years old. Over the last 18 months, the FAA Part 23 Reorganization Aviation Rulemaking Committee has worked to create a regulatory environment that will contribute significantly to revitalizing the health and safety of new and existing small airplanes. SARA requires the implementation of the Part 23 ARC recommendations by the end of 2015. Congressman Pompeo says, quote, with this bill, we can ensure that the general aviation industry has what it needs to thrive, end quote. The EAA Air Venture Cup race will feature a new starting point in 2013. This year's course will start at Mount Vernon Airport in Illinois, include two turn points, and end at Wopaka Municipal Airport, about 30 miles northwest of Oshkosh. Officials are also adding several new classes of aircraft to the race, including production-built aircraft, vintage airplanes, and warbirds. Each class has a first, second, and third place award. The EAA Air Venture Cup race provides builders and pilots an opportunity to race their aircraft in a safe and fun environment, all while promoting aviation in and over the communities where the races are held. The Air Venture Cup race is a timed event where participants are competing against the clock. Race applications will be available on the organization's website starting Monday, May 13th, and will be due no later than July 1st. The first fly-in arrested landing of the X-47B Unmanned Combat Air System Demonstrator has been successfully completed by the U.S. Navy and Prime Contractor Northrop Grumman. Conducted May 4th at the Navy's shore-based Catapult and Arresting Gear Complex at Patuxent River Naval Station in Maryland, the test represents the first arrested landing by a Navy unmanned aircraft. It marks the beginning of the final phase of testing prior to carrier-based trials planned for later this month. During an arrested landing, the incoming aircraft extends its landing hook to catch a heavy cable extended across the aircraft's landing area. The tension in the wire brings the aircraft to a rapid and controlled stop. The X-47B is a tailless autonomous aircraft designed with unique features for an unmanned aircraft, such as carrier-suitable landing gear and structure. While the X-47B itself will not be used for operational use, the UCASD program is developing a concept of operations and demonstrating technologies for use in follow-on unmanned carrier-based aircraft programs. A 30-year-old Michigan man is organizing a recovery team to rescue a downed B-25 from Alaska. This June, Patrick Mahalik from Brighton, Michigan is planning to attempt to recover a nearly 70-year-old North American B-25J Mitchell bomber from a remote crash site. The World War II era bomber has been nicknamed Sandbar Mitchell. After serving her duties with the U.S. Air Force from 1944 to 1959, she was one of several B-25s used in Alaska in the late 1960s to help fight forest fires. On June 27, 1969, she experienced double engine failure and the pilot made a belly landing on a small dry sandbar in the middle of the Tanana River. He walked away, but the right wing was damaged 
and the forward fuselage was wrinkled. After removing her engines, propellers, and wheels, she was abandoned. Though over the years, she has been further damaged by souvenir seekers. Someday, they hope to fly her as Sandbar Mitchell under the public trust for the nonprofit Warbirds of Glory Museum. A crowdfunding campaign has been launched on Kickstarter.com to help raise the cash needed for the recovery operation. The Canadian maple leaf is just a bit redder than usual. As Canadians are expressing their anger at what they feel is a backdoor attempt to move the ICAO from Montreal to Doha, Qatar. The Emirate of Qatar last month reportedly presented the ICAO with an unsolicited offer to move the agency's headquarters. Qatar offered to build a new headquarters building to pay for the moving expenses as well as any termination expenses resulting from Canadians who might not want to move to Qatar, thus losing their jobs. The move would take place in 2016. The rumor is that the Emirate did not consult the Canadian Foreign Minister before presenting the offer to the ICAO. There is reportedly some political motivation behind the offer. The Qatari government is said to be critical of Canada's pro-Israel position, and some Arab states have had differences with Canada on other aviation issues as well including requests for more landing slots for Qatari and UAE airlines in Canada that have been blocked by Canadian airlines. The proposal to move the headquarters would require the approval of 60% of the ICAO's 191 member states. A vote will be held in September. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website or our podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. The MBAA said in a news release Monday that it welcomes renewed calls to the FAA from a bipartisan coalition of lawmakers in the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives to halt the planned closings of 149 contract control towers. Last week, President Obama signed into law the Reducing Flight Delays Act of 2013, authorizing the FAA to reallocate funds within its own budget to end employee furloughs at ATC towers across the country. Tower proponents say the bill has also given the FAA the flexibility to use agency funding to stave off tower closures, which are currently scheduled to begin June 15. An amateur video captured an accident at the Madrid Air Show on Sunday, resulting in the fatal injury of the pilot of an HA-200 Saida aircraft that went down during its demonstration. The pilot initially survived the accident, but was severely burned and died of his injuries at a Madrid hospital. The accident occurred at Cuatro Vientos Airfield. The HA-200 was built in the 1950s and was one of the first jets to be manufactured in Spain. The pilot, 35-year-old Ladislao Tejedor Romero, was said to have been an experienced jet pilot, according to a spokesman for Spain's Ministry of Defense. The pilot was the only fatality from the accident, but a rescue worker was treated for burns and a second suffered from smoke inhalation and was treated at the scene. A third person, thought to be the pilot's father, 
reportedly suffered from an anxiety attack and was taken to a hospital. The FAA has selected free flight systems to provide upgraded ADS-B avionics for as many as 600 aircraft that were instrumental in the development of ADS-B in the capstone program. The FAA chose free flight systems for the ADS-B upgrade program after an industry-wide open competitive bidding process. The FAA funded the installation of first-generation systems in exchange for pilot feedback to help refine the technologies and determine performance requirements. The FAA also committed to upgrade the avionics to meet the requirements as defined in the ADS-B version 2 final rule. Installations of the newer rule-compliant free flight systems ADS-B avionics are expected to be completed by the end of 2014. The capstone program uses ADS-B and other technologies to trap aircraft in vast expanses of airspace beyond radar coverage and provides pilots with terrain, weather, and traffic data for viewing on cockpit displays. The program has been a success, resulting in a 57% reduction in the number of aviation accidents and fatalities in Alaska over a 12-year period. Today, ADS-B is a cornerstone technology with the comprehensive next-gen modernization of the U.S. airspace system. It's Friday, and while most of us are just looking forward to the weekend, ANN's Editor-in-Chief Jim Campbell is peering a bit further into the future. In this week's barnstorming commentary, Jim imagines the future cub and the tomorrow hawk. As we've been hinting for a number of months, we've been working on a project with a number of aviation's most progressive people about how to jumpstart, well, let's not call it jumpstart anymore, let's call it what it is, reinvent aviation. We know aviation is swirling the drain. And I, I pretty much base this on what I call the Heathkit conundrum. For those of you who are about my age may remember building great little electronics from kits until electronics evolved to the point where well, you really couldn't build them anymore, and you certainly couldn't save any money by building it yourself from kits and blah, blah, blah. And a wonderful little part of an industry that disappeared, and boy, I sure miss it. But the fact of the matter is, is the industry could not keep up with the times. We're hoping that aviation isn't subject to that kind of problem. However, we do believe that there's a future, but only with radical change. And it's not a matter of a solution. It's a matter of a hundred. And that's a hundred primary solution for the other thousand micro solutions to follow, all resulting in the kind of evolutionary and then revolutionary change necessary to reinvent an industry that can survive the future. Let's take a look at one interesting little posit though. Uh, aviation surrounded itself in many ways by a couple of iconic designs, the Piper Cub, the Skyhawk, a number of others that really uh, came to prominence because they were amazing little airplanes that fulfilled a niche and a need better than most of its competition. What I'd like to posit to you and what I'd like to get your suggestions on, on what will the future Cub and the Tomorrow Hawk look like in the days to come? The future Cub is a two-place sport aircraft, maybe aerobatic, maybe what, uh, but certainly maybe tandem, maybe side by side, maybe it's a tail dragger, maybe it's a trike. It doesn't matter. What it matters is that the aircraft can be manufactured cost effectively, that it can perform, that it's safe, that it uh, offers a jump forward in some form or fashion of, of technology over the, cup, the Piper Cub that it is intended to replace. Where will the future Cub come from? What will it look like? What must it cost? What can it do? How do we deal with liability? How do we deal with a number of the expenses that go into it? Uh, you've certainly got to get the cost of manufacture down. You've certainly got to get the liability issue under control. The most critical components, most expensive components, for instance, power plants, well, that cost has to come down dramatically. And the Tomorrow Hawk, a solid four-place aircraft, something that can go places and do things and do it cost effectively, when the typical Skyhawk these days goes out the door for well over $300,000, something's wrong. The Tomorrow Hawk can't cost nearly that much. But at the same time, it's got to give a value and a capability that will allow people to make what will still be a large capital investment. So I'm going to leave it up to you guys. Future Cub, Tomorrow Hawk, what do you think? What is it going to take?
what are the capabilities necessary for these airplanes to bring you back into the future of aviation? And more important, the people around you have always wished to aviate and never quite been able to do so because it was too expensive, too complex, and didn't offer them what they really wanted. The future cub, the tomorrow hawk. What do you think? Tell me what you think it means. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell. Thinking of the future. The catchphrase, you go girl, has taken on new meaning at Sky Shuttle Helicopters Limited as they have just announced Captain Meg Lamb and First Officer Kirsty Holtkamp as the company's first ever all-female helicopter crew to operate flights between Hong Kong and Macaw. Captain Meg Lamb was born and raised in Hong Kong and joined Sky Shuttle as a ground safety controller. In 2002, when Sky Shuttle launched a cadet pilot program for Hong Kong and Macaw residents, she was selected and then participated in a nine-month training course in Australia and graduated as a first officer. In 2012, Meg became a captain with Sky Shuttle, and now she has over 11 years of flying experience. First officer Kirsty Holtkamp was born in the Netherlands. Kirsty has always been amazed by helicopters, but flying remained a dream for a long time until she found a way to achieve that dream by training in the United States. Kirsty says, quote, I love to fly between Hong Kong and Macaw. Every time I fly into Hong Kong Harbor, I am fascinated with the view, and every night flight into Macaw is a vibrant light show. Well, that's our program. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories at aero-news.net. And please remember that Aeroborne is streamed twice weekly and is always online. Please join us again next Tuesday for another edition of Aeroborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.